Hello, my name is RJ Podesky, and I'm here today to discuss with you the work that Lacey Lorman and I have done on how radio frequency identification, or RFID, is improving the guest experience at Walt Disney World. RFIDs have long been used by businesses to track products and materials both upstream and downstream through the supply chain. And from 2013 to 2014, the RFID market has increased by 115% and has continued um, to be expected to grow by 30% annually through the year 2024. Uh, but in, particular, in particularly, uh, the Walt Disney World has found an innovative use for the RFID technology uh, with the use of its My Magic Plus system to revolutionize the guest experience at Walt Disney World and their Orlando Resort. Uh, as a result, this has improved the guest experience uh, to make the magic happen, um, and it's also brought about some operational efficiencies within their park uh, management area. For our research, we'd like to walk through with you um, some of the histories of radio frequency identification, specifically and technically how it works, some different applications of how it's used in business, uh, explain more about Walt Disney World and how it's using its new My Magic Plus system that was implemented in 2013, how this in, particularly, in particular pardon me, improves the guest experience in the theme parks and the resort area, there are, however, some pitfalls and some considerations that need to be addressed, and so we'll talk about those, and then give you some thoughts in terms of where RFID is headed in the years to come. Radio frequency identification, or RFID, is not necessarily a new technology. It's been available at least in concept since World War II when transponders were used to identify whether aircraft was friend or foe, uh, certainly uh, helpful during the wartime. In the 50s and 60s, more concepts and prototypes were developed. Uh, specifically the electronic article surveillance tags uh, that were developed in the late 1960s that explored the technology further. Uh, the theory of RFID and additional trials happened throughout the next, uh, the next decade and in the 70s and 80s we started to finally have some early adopters and implementations of RFIDs. Uh, now as one would expect with, uh, with Moore's Law, uh, the technology started out rather large and rather cumbersome, uh, but nonetheless the technology continued to shrink over time um, and become uh, more higher capacity as well. Uh, since then standards have emerged and now it is uh, very widely adopted in several industries uh, in business. Uh, one of the, the images you can see here is some early uh, prototypes of RFIDs on your left. You can see the size of a penny there at the top and in retrospect the, the size of those tags, if you will, underneath. And you can see now that they are uh, becoming about the size of a grain of rice um, and the price continues to decrease um, as we've seen with other pieces of technology as well. Radio frequency, radio frequency identification is made up of three main components. Uh, one of them is the antenna coil, a transceiver that has a decoder included with it, and a transponder that is more commonly known as the tag itself. Uh, there are two different types of RFID tags. One is passive. This contains no battery uh, and uses reflectivity off of the antenna built into the tag in order to activate that tag and read it from the reader and capture the data. Uh, there's, there are also active tags as well and active tags um, do have a, a low voltage battery included with them. Uh, they can store more data and can activate on their own whereas a passive tag needs the reader in order to be activated um, through its data transmission. Uh, these work off of several different radio frequencies. The most common today are both um, high frequency and then ultra high frequency or UHF. Uh, typically the passive tags can store about two kilobytes of data where some of the newer versions um, can even even store four or eight kilobytes of data. Uh, these typically 
uh, are only meant to store a unique serial number on that tag and then thereby once that tag is read in through the reader fed across a data network and into a server or through some sort of handheld device or reader connected to some equipment then that unique serial number would then be linked up through uh, most likely a relational database system where then that item or even uh, whatever that's attached to could be recognized and attached to other associated data. These tags um, uh, depending on the frequency, the, the lower band or short range frequency of around 13.56 uh, megahertz uh, usually um, can be read from a few inches uh, or a few millimeters even to um, a couple hundred feet if we get into the long range readers that work off of uh, more ubiquitous 2.4 gigahertz frequencies uh, for the longer range reads. Here's another display where you can see the relationship between that tag or that transponder uh, being picked up by the antenna. That could again be a few millimeters, a few inches, or even a few hundred feet depending on whether it is a short range or long range read. Um, and then connected to uh, the computer. Um, these readers um, are not meant to just pick up one tag at a time, but they can actually read several hundreds of tags at a time, uh, which makes it scale very conveniently. So I mentioned earlier that RFID tags are used in supply chain management, uh, typically used to track products as they move um, from raw materials through the manufacturing process and into completion. Uh, they're also used to identify uh, when products get loaded onto uh, trucks, uh, when they get unloaded. Uh, specifically, uh, Walgreens uses them to tag all of their pharmaceuticals so they, they know that each specific uh, pharmaceutical drug has been loaded onto a truck, has been loaded off of a truck, and been inventoried properly inside of the uh, inventory within the, the pharmacy counter at the store. Um, you'll also see RFID and other uses probably driving uh, down a tollway. Um, Illinois uses the iPass system that has an RFID tag that is built into uh, built into a reader that mounts in the, win in the windshield of the car and reads as it passes um, underneath um, uh, an arch that has several readers located on it. Uh, other systems such as Florida uses the Sun Pass and out east uses the Easy Pass at all use this RFID technology. Uh, if you've ran a, a local 5K half marathon or marathon recently, uh, a lot of these races over the last uh, decade or so have gone to using chip technology instead of hand timing the events so that when an, a participant crosses the finish line, their specific time for that race has been tagged. Um, and as a result, uh, larger races from uh, a few hundred to tens of thousands of people can now be accurately recorded and all that information can be uh, pushed up to the internet so that folks have exposure to that data uh, real time. Recently though, in uh, 2013, the Walt Disney World Company uh, launched a new program called My Magic Plus in their Orlando theme parks. Uh, this program was meant to revolutionize the way in which guests experience the theme parks and the resorts in Orlando. Uh, Disney, and under the leadership of CEO Bob Iger, invested over $1 billion um, into this system. Uh, it took over 1,000 cast members, uh, not employees, but cast members at Disney make note of that. Um, and this integrated system used this uh, rubberized band that almost looked like a Fitbit, if you will, and you can see an image of that uh, there on the slide next to the Mickey ears, the red band there. So this was a, this was a rubberized band that was waterproof, contained um, two different RFID tags inside, both short, uh, short range and long range, uh, to be able to integrate several different pieces within the resort and theme parks. Uh, this magic band, um, as it's appropriately called, it was used for theme park entry, um, so your park passes were loaded into your account. It was also used for uh, hotel room entry. Uh, Disney converted over 28,000 of their resort rooms um, to use um, RFID technology instead of the um, typical magnetic stripe that you see in several hotel rooms. 
Disney also previously had um, a system called FastPass where uh, riders could go to um, an attraction, they could uh, scan their theme park pass and get a paper ticket that allowed them to come back to that ride for a, a one hour window. Um, now with the use of the Magic Band, uh, guests can go online through their entire ecosystem of mobile and web applications and schedule those fast passes up to 60 days in advance um, to select a one hour window that's available uh, so that they can go enjoy that attraction without having to wait in line. Uh, the Magic Band can also be used for electronic payments so they converted all of their point of sale terminals to include um, RFID readers uh, that includes, uh, so the, the user scans their, their magic band at the point of sale terminal and then enters in um, a private PIN no different than a debit card to process a transaction. Uh, Disney's also launched um, portions of their rides that include long range reader capability uh, so that they can take pictures of individuals while they're on um, certain attractions and post those to their account later on. Uh, other examples of how the RFID technology is being used is in a system they, they call PhotoPass, where uh, cast members um, are stationed throughout the theme parks with uh, cameras as photographers, and they'll take pictures of families and individuals, um, and then scan their fast pass, or excuse me, scan their Magic Band, so that those photos can be available either on their mobile device or through their web application when uh, when the guest returns home. Now, as you can imagine, that's quite a quite an implementation and a rollout uh, for a program to of that magnitude. Um, one of the other pieces that Disney had to do is because it's integrated with their entire ecosystem of their mobile application, uh, theme park guests they knew in advance were going to be attached to their phones and their tablets to access their account data while they were in the theme parks. So, in addition to uh, the RFID Magic Band based system, Disney also rolled out uh, complete free Wi-Fi to their entire resort that spans acres in what used to be, as, as most of us know, are those small parcels of, of land that uh, Walt Disney himself bought years ago, Swampland in Florida. Um, all that area now has free Wi-Fi available in the resort area and the parks so that guests can interact with that mobile application, uh, make dining reservations, check on their fast passes, potentially change those fast passes, um, and link up with other family members as well. This My Magic Plus system has certainly affected the guest experience. The whole idea of, of implementing this system was to bring customers closely, closer to that Disney brand. Pardon me, Disney brand. Um, that the experience doesn't just happen when you arrive at the theme park for the first time and you're walking into Magic Kingdom, but the experience itself began long before you even got in the car or landed at the landed at the Orlando airport. Uh, the trip itself began when you booked it online and from there you could begin customizing your experience. Everything from the color of your magic band to your name displayed on the back using uh, mass customization techniques to make that experience as personal as possible. To bring anticipation into that trip with your family um, to the theme parks and to the resort area actually experiencing it while you're there and then having that data available to um, to customize so that the family can continue to enjoy that vacation when they returned home through items such as the photo pass system that I mentioned earlier um, or even sending targeted emails for additional merchandise um, or deals to return again. Uh, as a result of implementing the My Magic Plus system, uh, Disney saw a 50% increase in FastPass participation over that paper ticket method that was used before. Also, uh, Disney has seen some operational efficiencies um, as the wait times have decreased by 25% on average. Um, so not only does this make their parks more efficient, and we've now distributed guests across uh, the theme parks more equitably, thereby making it uh, seem less crowded, but guests are waiting less time in line. And the less time guests wait in line means that they get to experience more attractions, more of the theme parks, 
and as Disney would hope, be driving more revenue because they have more time to spend in in gift shops and in buying food um, and adding additional ticket items to um, that vacation experience. Uh, but not only this, but it also lessens the level of frustration. Guests spending hours waiting in line to ride an attraction that wait that lasts maybe one to two minutes. Um, now the guest has a more seamless experience, um, and as Disney would say, it allows the magic to happen, and they've removed the barriers that uh, used to exist in crowded, uh, in crowded spaces such as those in theme parks. That guest experience is so important to Disney that they didn't want it to just happen once. And how Disney is affecting the guest experience with RFID uh, is, is paramount to uh, this system itself. And Disney also lists um, within uh, their website and gives guests as many details as they can with regards to how that RF device or magic band works. Um, and so this is just an example of some of their language um, and how that data is being protected and how it operates similar to electronic payments on our credit cards or even toll payment systems, as I mentioned earlier. Now, how this gets tied together, especially in some marketing content and, and considerations, is again, Walt, Walt didn't want guests to show up and visit their theme parks just once. He wanted them to show up again and again and enjoy their favorite attractions as much as possible. And so as a result, what, uh, what this RFID system does for Disney is allows them to engage in what's considered to be called the customer loyalty loop as defined by McKinsey and Company in 2009. Uh, to give you an example of what this means is all of us as consumers begin by evaluating an initial consideration set of products or services that be, we may be interested in purchasing or engaging in. We evaluate those and we gather information. Uh, for Disney, what this means is they're doing the most that they can through the data that they gather about us and personalize and customize those messages to us um, and show just exactly how that magic can happen within their parks. Once we book or select that vacation plan with Disney, we've, re we've achieved that moment of purchase that you see on the right side of this image. Um, and for any company, but particular in Disney, it's going to be cheaper for them in the long run to maintain us as a customer um, over the long haul rather than going out and finding new customers and, and risk losing us. So for us, um, it's about staying inside of that loyalty loop as consumers to Disney and to other companies. How can you continue to make sure that my guest experience is better than any other place, any other theme park, or any other resort opportunity for your family so that the, the family wants to continue to go back again and again and engage in that loyalty loop? Over time, that means more data is gathered about that individual, which can be done through the use of the RFID My Magic Plus system, and that experience can continue to be customized over time, um, and that loyalty loop continues even, as I mentioned earlier, as the family goes home and relives that experience, keeping it top of mind awareness as a recency piece that they can then use to say, when's the next time we're going to Disney World when we get back home? Now it hasn't been all sunshine and roses with the implementation of the My Magic Plus system. Uh, there have been a few pitfalls. Uh, when this was first first launched, uh, Massachusetts uh, Senator Ed Markey released a letter to Chairman Bob Iger uh, pretty much chastising him that the new system was jeopardizing the safety of the children wearing the magic band and exposing their data needlessly into the public. Uh, Chairman Iger responded with those data privacy and security concerns and reassured both Congressman Markey and the public that the institutional data gathered from that RFID tagged object um, is not being shared with third parties, um, and it is optional. Uh, Disney has made it very clear and made their privacy policy and security concerns posted on their website. Um, they've tried to be as transparent as possible how that data is being used and how it's not being used or shared with others. 
uh, a common mis misconception is that RFID, because it can track where things are, um, is not the same as GPS. And so it doesn't use the satellite system um, in effect that the RFID reader can be used when you're back at home and know where you or your children are. But the fact that the RFID system itself is limited to the readers that are connected to Disney system. Um, and so while it may be used for safety purposes with inside the parks, um, that data is staying institutional within the Walt Disney Company. Um, some other issues that have come up through that phased in approach that, you know, this uh, this system was implemented over over 18 months um, and spent years in development. And in fact, um, that team of engineers that built this system um, used um, a soundstage behind uh, one of the attractions in the theme parks in, in Hollywood Studios. Uh, to actually build a mock-up theme park inside that soundstage. They could test every aspect of this and, and bring in folks uh, to make sure it worked absolutely seamlessly. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, those who were returning guests and already in that loyalty loop, uh, they had a hard time adjusting to the new system. Uh, for those who are affectionately known as ride reiterators who like to hop on a ride and then once they're done hop back on the ride again, um, they knew how that paper-based fast pass system worked. And so it took time for folks already in that loyalty loop to adjust um, and figure out the new system, um, not necessarily how to game it, but how to make it work seamlessly with their experience. Disney's also started to um, expand the use of its long-range readers a little bit more. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they're using them to uh, take pictures using the PhotoPass system while guests are on attractions such as a roller coaster. Um, and now they're even using them to deliver customized messages to individuals such as the, the picture here in the bottom, which is of the, uh, the boat attraction, It's a Small World in Magic Kingdom. And now they're delivering customized messages. So once it picks up that unique serial number from that long range RFID tag in the magic band, it's delivering a customized goodbye message to um, the guest on the attraction, such as goodbye Lacey um, in one of several different languages. The My Magic Plus system combined with several new park attractions over the last couple years have certainly added to uh, the number of tourists that can come to the Disney area um, in Orlando and experience the parks. Um, the first year of implementation, Disney was able to support an additional 3,000 guests during the holiday season, uh, all attributed to the My Magic Plus system. Uh, not only is this improving the guest experience, but it's also adding operational efficiencies. So they can use it for crowd control and they can distribute um, guests throughout the parks and the resorts more equitably, like I mentioned earlier. And so this is helping to not only increase revenue, but now that because they can get more people inside the parks, uh, but uh, it's again also improving that guest experience because uh, guests inside of a completely crowded park are probably going to be unhappy guests. So where's RFID going? Um, in the last two weeks here in the middle of November um, of 2016, uh, we learned that uh, Delta has just invested $50 million um, into baggage tracking uh, to help reduce those, uh, those lost uh, pieces of luggage on our flights. Um, and they're they're not only using RFID tags instead of those old um, sticker-based systems that were um, UPC or barcodes, uh, but uh, they are connecting these to uh, mobile apps so that users know when uh, their bag has been loaded onto the plane, when the bag has arrived at uh, baggage carousel, as you can see from the notifications and the image on the right. Uh, and they're also using those to actually stop conveyor belts if uh, a piece of luggage is going on the wrong plane. Uh, TSA is piloting now in Atlanta automated conveyor belts so that those that uh, those bins that are um, tagged specifically with maybe something that needs to be reviewed, um, it's being sent down a separate conveyor belt um, instead of the one where you um, continue on. So they're trying to make those lines quicker. Um, and in the entertainment um, and recreation area, a company called Top Golf, which has uh, a chain of facilities in several large uh, metro market areas, um, are embedding RFID chips inside of golf balls um, so that you don't just go to the driving range and uh, 
plow through the bucket real quick, but in a multi-story environment, uh, you can get together with friends and you can enjoy competitions and those RFID readers then read the, um, where the golf ball is, how far it traveled. Um, and they invent, um, games to create a more interactive environment and bring more people to the sport. In closing, we've seen that RFID technology uh, continues uh, to come up with new uses beyond the supply chain. The technology continues to shrink. It continues to get smaller, um, just as we have seen through uh, Moore's Law. Uh, we're seeing more innovative uses. We're seeing them attached to people, um, which certainly brings about data privacy concerns. Um, it's not so much of a data privacy concern when we're talking about benign objects and parts walking through a manufacturing process. But once we attach these to people, data privacy and where that data is stored, um, how it's captured and who it's shared with becomes incredibly important. Um, and security becomes even more of an issue as we see um, cyber threats around the world on a daily basis basis. However, uh, we continue to see this technology being used in innovative ways. Um, we feel that this continues to be a valuable technology that technologies will implement when there's an opportunity to increase revenue, to increase the operational efficiency and potentially decrease costs. And as we've seen in the example of the Walt Disney World, they're using it to improve customer service and keep people engaged in a brand and make the magic happen. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Our last few slides have a list of our references that are included in our paper for you to view as well. Again, thanks so much.